Thank you everybody for joining us on your lunch hour to talk about planning for retirement. Again, with our partner in power and specifically Ben, I am Jessica Keegan. My pronouns are she, her. I'm coming from the Office of Economic Empowerment and I'll just run us through some housekeeping and general talks before we get into the meat of the presentation. So we're just going to go through about who the Office of Economic Empowerment is, any disclosures and housekeeping, then we'll go into the presentation and rest assured we will have time for a Q&A at the end. So the Office of Economic Empowerment is a department within the state treasurer. Uh, we are unique because we are also a 501c3 and that really, really follows through what our mission is, which focuses on serving all people throughout the state making sure they have access to financial education, closing the race and gender wage gap, racial equity, especially pay equity, college affordability, and STEM education. Since this is a Zoom webinar, it might not look like any of the Zoom meetings you have been in in the past. Um, so this Zoom webinar will be recorded. It will be uploaded onto a public website. We will make sure to get that link out to you in our follow-up email as it will be put up on our YouTube page. And any information shared through the question functions will be anonymous, but since we are a public entity, uh, the chat record is subject to public record laws. Any other housekeeping here is that as you notice with this webinar, you're not able to turn on your camera or unmute yourselves. You still will be able to chat with us if you need us and to ask questions, please use the Q&A function. If you have any questions as they come up, we will try to take those. And again, we will have that dedicated time at the end for Q&A. Um, as well as at the end, we do have a post survey right when you hit exit, it'll pop up just if you wouldn't mind answering that for us, so we can make sure to keep giving you content that you like and is useful to you. Okay, if you like these Money Talk Tuesdays, have been to them before, check out some of our other OEE events. If you really wanna keep up that financial education, visit our myfinancialifema.org website. And if you have any questions about this or in general, you can feel free to reach us at our email address, moneytalk at tre.state.ma.us, and I will turn it over to Ben to let this get started. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting us. Um, I am with Empower. I have been working with retirement participants all over the U.S. for about 25 years, and I am a certified financial planner, and I've been uh, working as that for the past 15 years. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you uh, this presentation on planning for retirement. It can be one of the, the biggest um, time periods of your life. If you actually think about it, it could be 20, 30 years. So definitely something that you want to plan for. And we'll talk about all of the different ways uh, that you can prepare for that. So with that, I am going to share my screen and we will be off and running in one moment. Okie doke. Uh, Jessica, just a quick check. Is everybody able to see my screen there? Yes, we can see your presentation. All screen. right. Well, as you can see, it's a welcome to planning for retirement. And what we're going to do is look at becoming a smarter investor. Uh, and that starts really by understanding the language from the very beginning. Um, and also how these different terms work together. Whether you want to manage your own investments or simply want a better understanding of the terminology and principles of investing and how they work together, here are some terms that are good to know, the kind of the four fundamentals. An asset class is a group of similar types of investments. I'm sure you've probably heard of stocks, which are ownership in a company, or bonds, which are essentially a loan given to a company or the government in return for a stated rate of interest, uh, and cash, cash alternatives, the bank, money market deposits, really with practically no investment risk. Asset allocation is a very, very important term. It's simply choosing how much to invest in each asset class when you create your portfolio. 
Now, most people might think of investing as, am I choosing the right thing right now? Well, believe it or not, your asset allocation counts for about 90% of the overall return that you might get in a portfolio. Now, diversification is simply not putting all your eggs in one basket. You're not putting everything perhaps in stocks or bonds or a specific asset class. That is to help reduce the risk in the portfolio. And I'll show you a chart next, which is going to demonstrate that. And then the final term, rebalancing, is looking at your asset allocation, and things may grow or decline within that, essentially getting it out of whack. And rebalancing is a way to put it back essentially into the right gear so that your risk tolerance and preference is enforced. Um, in doing so, you may be actually selling some things that are high which is going to generate a gain, or buying in at some things that may have had a loss. But rebalancing is a very important technique to be able to do that. Now, this chart is not an eye exam, but what it does is it shows annual returns for different asset classes from the years 2002 through 2020. And as you can see, it would probably be pretty hard to guess which asset class would be the best performing next year or throughout. If we could, we could all probably retire right now. But this is showing there is very, very little way to determine what might be the best asset class. Um, if you do look, for example, in 2018, blue up on that top right, cash was actually the best performer. The next year, it was the worst performer. So this is where diversification, not putting all your eggs in one basket, having a blend of these types of things, hopefully ensures that you might catch somewhat of a gain by having one or more or all of these asset classes as you go forward. Now, why diversification? As you can imagine and understand from that, all your investments are gonna react differently in any given economic situation. I'd say that 2022 is a pretty good example of that. There are a lot of different things going on uh, in the economy. Um, when it changes, the investments that are perhaps doing well may not start to do so well. And the investments that were not doing well may start to do well overall. Rather than guess how to invest or try to quote unquote time the market, you can diversify by owning investments in more than one asset class or by owning different types of investments within that same asset class. So for example, stocks, they can be large US companies, large growth like a Google, uh, large value like a Berkshire Hathaway or small little companies, even mid-sized companies. While diversification does not assure a profit, or protect against loss of principle, it may help reduce overall volatility, which is prevalent in the markets and can help manage the overall risk that you have. Cash alternative options, bonds and stocks are all used to accomplish these different investing objectives. So cash, as you might think and learn, are relatively low risk investments that focus on capital preservation and liquidity while seeking to provide some steady returns. Um, they typically have lower returns over time and may have a different type of risk, not investment risk, but inflation risk. And I think this year is probably one of the best examples of that. If your cash investments are earning a very, very, very small rate of return, but inflation is getting higher and quite high, that can be a risk in itself, inflation risk. Now, bonds, as I mentioned, are debt obligations of governments or corporations. The borrower promises to pay interest at a stated rate and return the borrowed amount by a maturity date. They can be short, medium, or long-term bonds, and they provide interest income, and that can be subject to interest rate risk. So as interest rates typically go up, bond value may go down because people can go out and get bonds in the marketplace now that have a higher rate of interest. 
Stocks, as we've mentioned, ownership, small, medium, and large. They can certainly have um, higher growth potential, but also more market risk. Um, stocks are typically categorized as something that might be a little bit more risky in a portfolio. So depending on your risk tolerance and time horizon, you may elect a different percentage in each of these investment types. And that percentage is what is used to make up that asset allocation that is so crucial. And also then rebalancing those over time so that you don't actually think you have, say, 50% in stocks. In reality, you might have 80% if you haven't looked at your portfolio in a long time. I mean, great that the value has gone up, but you're suddenly in a higher risk category that you might not want to be in. A nice way to combine these types of things are investment options that provide a diversified mix from different asset classes or investment categories and maybe are aligned with an expected retirement date. So target date funds provide that diversified mix of investments from diversified asset classes or investment categories, and you can align them with your retirement date. That's why the name of, a, say, a 2035 fund may be something that begins a little more aggressively and starts getting more conservative as you reach that retirement date in 2035. They are professionally managed. They typically are a single fund. And as I mentioned, they can be with many investment companies called the you know, Target 2035 fund. Um, and again, that is something that is going to be managed for you but in one fund, which can be a very attractive option, as you always know that you know, you're going to be in the correct fund based on when your retirement date is going to be. Now, once we are in retirement or getting there, we want to take a look at income planning, which is the process of evaluating a retiree's assets so that you can support your lifestyle throughout retirement. Um, and then if there are any income gaps, you really want to work on how to fix those. So as you're approaching retirement, you want to review what some of the income sources you may have. So some may be like pensions, which are typically guaranteed income from either a private or public state federal employer. So you might be getting X amount of dollars every month from that. Social Security, which is run by the government, and I'll go over that in a little while, but that is something that is also really kind of considered guaranteed income. Employer-sponsored plans, which we're going to talk about in a moment. IRAs, also talk about those. And then annuities, which are guaranteed income streams typically backed by an insurance company. Uh, and that can be bought out in the marketplace. So those are some of the major sources of income that you're going to want to take a look at in retirement. Now, if we take a look at employer-sponsored retirement plans, the first are defined benefit. And that's what I mentioned by essentially a pension. You work for a set number of years, and based on a formula of your salary and years of service, that pension is going to give you a guaranteed set of income for either as long as you live, you and a spouse or partner live, you're able to really determine at retirement how you want your beneficiaries perhaps to receive that pension. Defined contribution plans is where money is set aside by you, the employee, and also the employer who may make employee contributions, um, also perhaps discretionary contributions, they can put that in at the end of the plan. That is where the investing burden is on you, the participant, to make those decisions, which is why there are solutions out in the marketplace like we just talked about in target date funds. Finally, non-qualified plans are typically offered to highly compensated employees and executives. The interesting part about them is typically contrib contributions are made by the plan sponsor and they continue to be the plan sponsor's assets. So there is the risk if the plan sponsor is not solvent that that could be a problem 
down the line. Non-qualified plans are a bit more complex in nature, but those are something that we could certainly talk about at a different uh, juncture. The types of employer-sponsored retirement plans. So these are where you as the employee have the ability to save through payroll deduction, and you're responsible really for maintaining the account and making sure that it's adhering to your guidelines and specifications. Again, there, there is help for that. Um, matching, as I mentioned, can be a great employee benefit. They might match a certain amount of a contribution that you put in each year. Um, they may even make that uh, discretionary contribution at the end of the year. So 401ks are typically for corporations. So, you know, if, if we're looking at, you know, Goodyear, for example, they may have a, a 401k plan. Um, some of the, the different plans that you work with now have a 401k plan. 403b plans are typically for not-for-profit, such as public school systems, hospitals, charities, and faith-based organizations. And then 457 plans are specifically designed for government employees. They work all very similar. It's just the kind of the wrapper that goes around the retirement plan based on the type of employer that you're working for. Now, in addition to that are IRAs, which are called individual retirement accounts. They're not related to any employer plan or plan sponsor. They are purely yours as an individual. Um, in fact, own, they can only be owned by an individual. You cannot have a joint account in an IRA. Now, traditional IRAs are money that you put in, which may or may not be tax deductible based on your income level, as well as the fact if you have an employer plan, but those go in and grow tax deferred until they are withdrawn. And the magic number here is 59 and a half, because once you're 59 and a half, you can take money from retirement accounts without a 10% federal tax penalty. So the IRAs grow tax deferred. They're taxed at in regular income rates upon distribution. Roth IRAs, which I would say, I don't want to say too new, but are relatively new, are IRAs where the money is taxed first, then you put it into the Roth IRA. And if it's been opened for five years and the owner has attained age 59 and a half, those distributions, when you take it out, are tax-free. So those can be very important to consider if they're offered in both your 401k plan or as an IRA. So if you think that you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later in life, Roth contributions can be a very good option for you. Um, it has the potential for long-term gains. Um, so earnings are going to be taxed unless they're qualified, which is that five-year, 59 and a half distribution rule. Um, they're frequently the last type of account that a retiree might want to take, especially if they're having to take out very significant distributions from their retirement accounts and are in a high tax bracket. So giving you a side-by-side -side comparison here. Um, the effect of contributions on a paycheck. So pre-tax contributions are deducted prior to tax withholding, as we talked about. And these contributions and any earnings grow tax deferred and are taxed as ordinary income upon distribution. Roth contributions are deducted after tax are withheld. And Roth contributions and any earnings are not taxable withdrawals that meet those IRS guidelines that I just mentioned. One way to potentially maximize and diversify your retirement savings is looking at how it's going to be taxed as it comes out. Most people don't think about that. Um, but a lot of people might consider the, the saying, it doesn't matter how much you earn, it's how much you keep that can be a very significant income level for you in retirement. 
So one way to potential, potentially maximize and diversify your retirement savings is to contribute both on a pre-tax and Roth basis. While it's important to consider how much you might want to contribute, the most important thing is to save as much as you comfortably can so you can get closer to the future that you want. Get into this a little bit later, um, but you don't have to invest all of your money in the same way. Uh, that's kind of the most important thing. And if you're really not sure how much you want to invest or how much might be comfortable for you, what's really good is most of these plans, if not all, allow you to make a payroll deduction selection. But let's say you take a look at that check the next time you see it, and it really is not what you want it to be, you can reverse that. So this is, again, in your control for what you want to do. It's not like you are stuck with anything for an entire year. And sometimes people do think that. Um, so as I was just saying. Ben, do you I, mind if I interrupt you sure. with a relevant question? All right. Um, we have somebody in the Q&A asking about IRAs. They're a little bit confused. Are IRAs taxed later during retirement? If you would be willing to specify and clarify. Sure thing. So a traditional IRA is an IRA where the money goes in pre-tax. So you weren't taxed on that money that you put in yet. That's going to grow tax deferred. And then if you're over 59 and a half, you're able to take that money out and it's treated as ordinary income. So it's like you earned it in a paycheck, a W-2. The difference with a Roth is you put in a set amount that you've already paid taxes on. It then grows tax deferred. And if you're 59 and a half and have had that Roth IRA for five years or more, it's tax free. So traditional IRA comes out, pay ordinary income taxes, Roth IRA, no taxes upon distribution. Hopefully that'll help. So as I mentioned, it can be great to split those contributions because unlike, also like IRAs, there are Roth 401ks as regular and traditional 401ks. Some plans offer both. So you could split it. Um, any matching contribution from an employer would go into a pre-tax account, but contributing both ways enables that great word again, diversification, but now we're diversifying our tax consequences. So that is something you can look into. We do always recommend that you consult your tax advisor for your personal situation to determine what's best for you. That is crucial. Again, this is just reiterating what we just talked about a little bit. So how your retirement income is taxed depends on how you made your contributions. So this counts both for IRAs and 401ks, 403bs, 457s. The ordinary income is if you had some after-tax money put in. Some plans allow for that. And that's for really people that have maxed out their 401k already. They've paid tax on their contribution, so they don't pay taxes on that again. But the earnings will be subject to the same rules that the traditional IRA and the tax deferred 401k is. So pre-tax, anytime you hear pre-tax, that means the government hasn't received any taxes on it and eventually they're going to want to. So that's the important thing. However, again, after tax contributions, Roth contributions and Roth qualified earnings are going to be tax free. So again, diversification is great among your investments and also among the way you are taxed, which can be really important. Now, and just taking a look yes. at that 59 and a half uh, age range, we have some questions about that. So okay. if you are over 60 years old, uh, mm -hmm. this contributions will be taxed if you don't withdraw it. We're just looking on some clarifications about the sure. age point and if you don't withdraw. Yep. I'll give you so exactly. So 59 and a half is the end of a 10% penalty if you took the money out. Now, when I say take the money out, consider that as money going from your 401k or IRA to your bank account. So that has become cash and liquid. 
that's when it's going to be taxed. Now, the government does not make you take out your 401k or IRA until you're age 72. It used to be 70 and a half, uh, but the SECURE Act with the coronavirus had Congress change some of the rules. And right now, it may change in the future, but at 72, if you haven't taken anything out, the government says, we want you to start taking it out. And that's typically based on a divisor. And what that means is the government takes a look at the December 31st value of your portfolio. And for that next year then says, okay, your age 72 or higher, for that aged individual, you have to take out X amount of dollars. And that is a typically by a divisor. So at someone who is 72, it's going to be somewhere around 27.4. Don't quote me exactly, but it's typically based on life expectancy tables that the government has. Now, why is it important to start taking those? Because if you don't, there is a 50% penalty on them if you don't. That's 5-0. So very important there. Um, so again, no 10% penalty after age 59 and a half. You could let it continue to grow or let it sit there. Starting at age 72, there are minimums that the government does require you to take. And taxes only come into play when you actually take a distribution and it gets into your bank account. So Social Security, uh, this is uh, a government program. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of it. Uh, it is an income program established by the U.S. Treasury based on the earnings that you've had throughout your life, um, the age at when you take it, and what types of benefits you decide you want. Now, what I mean by that is you can begin to take Social Security, which is like a, a, like a pension. You can take it as early as age 62, and the maximum amount you're going to get is at age 70. Now, is there a correct answer? When should I take it? It's going to be different for everyone. There is a significant decrease in the amount that you'll get if you take it at age 62, but that's not to say that's the, the wrong answer. There, there could be different issues in a person's life or, or health concerns. Um, when you receive your full benefit is either at age 66 or 67 if, if you're born in 1960 or later. Um, what you get is an 8% increase until you reach age 70. So you may want to uh, either wait for it if you really do want to wait for Social Security or take it earlier. The best way to find out is it, they used to send paper statements. Now you can go to ssa.gov, enter in all of your information on the secure site, and find out what your specific benefit will be. Because it's going to really vary for most people. It based on an average annual salary that goes up to about 142,800. So that's pretty much the maximum earnings that go toward paying into social security for an individual. That is typically adjusted upward each year. So you can see that someone making $65,000, um, if they are at full retirement age, so let's say they're at 67, would receive about $2,245 a month. Um, the amount of your salary and how much social security you get is going to really be the, the percentage of income that it might be replacing. Um, and as you can imagine, if you have a higher salary, social security is going to provide a, a smaller percentage of your income. Um, but really the best way to do this is to go on that ssa.gov site and you'll be able to get your specific earnings history um, and take a look at that going forward. So, and, and they they know it. I, I've, I've seen my statement and it even goes back to when I was in high school working at a pharmacy and they have my income from then. So um, it's great that, you, you know, they track it for that long. 
So this chart. Ben, do you mind if I interrupt you with some questions on, on this matter? Sure. Um, when we think about people who worked private and then later on worked in government, would you get your social security benefits as well as your government retirement? Honestly, it's going to depend. And I realize that's a little bit of a vague offset, uh, a vague answer. There, there is something called the government pension offset. So you would need to determine if in fact you're eligible for social security. So for example, I can say that the teachers in Massachusetts get a state pension. And as a result, are typically not eligible for social security. There may be individual cases where it's not, but if you've paid into an individual pension program in the government or uh, nonprofits, you would definitely want to check to see if you are able to receive social security. And you could contact social security for that, but that's a, that's a great question. Um, sometimes you might receive part of the social security and then you know the pension and benefit um, but typically, if if you have no pension benefit, you know whatsoever, and you work for a, a corporate entity, um, then Social Security will be there. But there are plenty of corporate entities that offer pensions, and the participants still get Social Security. So it really is in that public service area that you would need to to check. Thank you for clarifying on that part. Absolutely. Um, sure, I know that's, it's that's hard a great to, question. It depends. Exactly. Um, yeah, we have yeah. a much easier question for you to answer with a more okay. specific answer, not that the other was bad, mm -hmm. um, is when you're discussing the salary, is this salary gross or is it net? Uh, it is. That is a very good question that I may have to get back to you on. I believe it is net because the taxes have already been taken out. But no, I'm sorry. I believe it's gross because from that gross, you're going to have to pay into Social Security. But uh, Jessica, if I can just double check that after the of presentation and, and get that back to you, but that's a good question. Of course, we can put that in our follow-up email as well. Okay. Thank you for taking those two questions. Excellent. All right. So as I was saying, when you take Social Security, really depends on your personal situation. It's going to be different for, diff, different for everyone. Um, if you take it early at 62, you do get a lower amount. But if you live a long time, you're going to kind of win the race. What this is showing is at age 80, 85 and 90, the person, let's say at age 85, uh, decided to take Social Security at 62 uh, you know, over their lifetime. Uh, if they live to 85, they will have gotten $360,092. They waited till 66. They are getting some more for 17061. And if they waited till 70, by 85, they have the highest amount. However, at age 80, it doesn't always work that way. If you started at 62 and lasted till 80, you'd have a significantly lower amount. So it honestly depends on how long you're going to live. Um, the longer you live, the longer you're able to get that benefit because it is for life. So if you're living into your 90s and, and took it at age 70, you're going to end up with a higher amount in benefits overall. So um, again, really a personal choice. Check out the, the Social Security website, and that's really the best way to find out um, how it's going to specifically apply to you. Um, so that is really the bulk of the presentation. I am going to just display this for one moment, show you a couple of disclosures, and then I will jump back on camera for any questions. And I know this is not exactly easy to read, but uh, we'll put it up here for a second. And this, of course, is available after the presentation uh, to read as you'd like. All right, so let me...
And here I am. Fantastic. And we saw that slide. If you were saying, hmm, was that another advertisement for Real Money Talk Tuesday? Definitely check out the sequel to this uh, with the core plan for small nonprofits if you're interested next Tuesday. Uh, but Ben, we definitely have some questions coming gonna, in. Um, I'll go I'll go back to that slide just so you have it up there. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And we can leave this up so you have that information um, on where to go while we go into some questions. Um, let me know when you're ready to take some. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we had a lot of questions about the first subject matter that you talked about. Um, so let's see. Okay, um, somebody mentioned that they are planning to retire in three years and want to put money away in safe investments with higher interest rates. Um, I know this is complicated to say what do you suggest, but do you have any points to go towards for safe investments with higher interest rates? Um, that is going to be something that you would need to probably look at with either an investment advisor or someone. We, we can't really give investment advice in a in a vacuum. Um, I can honestly say the safest is the bank up to you know the FDIC, but the interest rates are very low. Um, typically, um, you know, there are there are bonds out there, but they can go down in value as I mentioned if interest rates go up. So it's it's a little bit difficult to um, to see that. But if you if you're working with an investment advisor, they should be able to help you and take you look take a look at things. There there are products within within insurance. There are, there are bonds. There are are many uh, many. But the only thing I can definitively say is a, a bank account. <laughs> but it's not going to have those high rates that we all wish. Of course, best steps next to check in with an investment advisor. Okay, and this has been asked by a couple people. Um, if you are at age 72, um, what funds are you able to take out? And will there be a tax that has not been, excuse me, a tax on what has not been cashed out? Okay, so at age 72, if you're still in um, let's say your employer's retirement plan, you would elect a distribution. Now, many distributions are just going to be pro rata. Um, there may be the opportunity to take only a, a, from a specific holding. For example, if you are in an IRA, um, you would need to talk to the servicer of that 401k or IRA to see what their distribution rules are. What I can tell you is, as I mentioned, anytime you take that money out is when it's going to be taxed as if it was a paycheck, unless it's the, the Roth IRA and qualified. Great, and so as a follow-up, when you do have to take that money out by age 72, do you get the choice to say which places the money that is in those dollars come from? Do you have to take it out, uh, excuse me, take out a certain amount of each bucket that you have or all of your funds? Typically it's gonna be a, dollar amount that you're given by the government, and it can be satisfied by different accounts that you might have. If there are multiple IRAs or 401ks, in general, it, it's it's kind of, they just care about getting that, that $1 amount out. Okay, thank you. And to move on from that question, um, how will it affect, uh, how will it affect me if I take money out from my right retirement account, let's say to buy a house? Um, it will, you'll simply take the distribution, again, pay taxes, whether it's a traditional 401k IRA or Roth IRA, it, it would go to your bank account and um, you'd be able to use those funds for any down payments or, or purchases. Thank you, Ben, for grabbing these rapid fire. Um, is there an RMD for Roth IRAs after 72? There. In, in terms of IRAs, no. In terms of 401ks, yes, but you don't pay taxes on the distributions. So there's a little bit of a differentiator there. Um, so no, if it's a Roth IRA, yes, it, if it's a 401k, but again, there would be no taxes due. They just, they make you take it out. 
Okay, thank you. Um, is there a specific amount on how much you can put towards your retirement account every year? Is there a limit to putting yep. into your retirement? Sure. Um, the a limit in terms of contributions that you can put in in a 401k is $20,500. And if you're 50 or older, you can put in another $6,500. So a total of $27,000. Your employer can then put in more than that, but it's going to depend on what they're willing to pay. In IRAs, it's $6,000 and $7,000 if you're 50 or over. Okay, great. The questions are slowing down. I will say we are getting a couple of more specific situations that I think might be uh, more unique and towards a uh, somebody who is specifically coaching you on your investment. Of course, Ben, if you'd like to take a look at these specificities, we can bring them up to you. Otherwise, I know that since we are slowing down in our questions, if there's anything you've noticed in the trend of these questions, if there's anything you would like to talk about, just to reiterate to the folks who may be a bit confused. Sure, no, I, I think that the taxation portion of this is probably the most confusing. And as I alluded to in the presentation, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Um, so there are gonna be you know, different ways to manage the taxation. And probably the newer concept for most people is the Roth IRA or the Roth 401k, which are, which are offered by, by many plans now. So just like you can diversify your investments, you might want to diversify how you're taxed ultimately. So sometimes people may actually be in a higher tax bracket in retirement than they were when they're working. So someone that saved a lot and has done well and in their late 70s may be required to take out very significant sums of money. If they were putting in Roth contributions all the time, that would be something that would be very beneficial to them and probably have them be in a less, less of a tax bracket going forward. So I think the, the distinction between traditional and Roth is something that, you know, Definitely, you can, you can look up on the, on the web and, and kind of review what those types of things are or go over it with your advisor. Um, I think that's probably the, the biggest trend that, that I saw from the presentation. Great. Thank you for diving down into that topic. We did get a few more questions. Um, so, for example, somebody says that they have a retirement plan that is still with a former employer and they have the option to keep it there, which they mm -hmm. did. How often should they be engaging with the former employer, or is it more to engage with the actual plan administrator? Well, the, the former employer is not really going to be involved. Um, it, it's the plan administrator that would be the professional association that handles distributions, might handle different, you know, uh, investment changes and things like that. Um, and you're right, if you have over a $5,000 balance in a prior employer, you do not have to take it out. Um, and you can certainly leave it there. Um, you do have the option to roll it to a new plan, to an IRA, uh, but typically the, uh, the employer is, is not gonna be involved at that point. They are, you know, this is the defined contribution. If it were a defined benefit plan, meaning a pension, then the employer is definitely involved. Okay, great. And on that matter, where can you start a retirement contribution if your current employer does not have one to offer? Pretty much any investment firm, can you could open an IRA. Um, you could put in up to 6,000 or 7,000 if you're over 50. You could make it a Roth IRA. If you don't have a retirement plan, no matter what you make and you open an IRA, you can deduct that from your taxes. So you could take away the, uh, the 6,000 or 7,000 off of your taxes. If you do have a retirement plan, there are income limits of how much that you can deduct, um, but that would be the place to start. Um, and even if someone just has earned income, if you have some earned income, you can start it with an IRA. That's really the best, uh, best place to put it. And again, an IRA is, is not the investment, it's the wrapper. It's kind of the tax wrapper over it. So the investments would be inside. So for example, you could have an IRA with a target date fund in it. 
And that's the investment. Okay, thank you. And speaking of uh, that previous question, um, somebody had asked about the best practice regarding keeping in touch with plant administrators, especially if you haven't worked with that uh, company for a while. If you aren't aware of who it is, how might you find out? Uh, for that, I would probably call the company, the, the former employer, because they, their HR would be able to tell you where, where is the 401k. So maybe they changed administrators. You haven't been up on that. They would be able to tell you uh, where to go and most likely give you the phone number. Fantastic. Thank you for answering that. Um, somebody asked, after a spouse passes, is the surviving spouse required for both RMD if they are the beneficiary? It will be based on the spouse's age. So it becomes their account and they are having to take it out based on as if as if it were their own. Um, now, if it's a non-spouse, this is a little different. They changed the law fairly recently, which a non-spouse has to take it out within 10 years. So they could wait all 10 years and then take it out. That's fine. Or they might want to divide it up. That's not the case for a spouse, though. It's just as if it was their own account. Okay, thank you very much for answering that question. At the moment, our questions are slowing down. Um, so I will just plug again, uh, if you are interested more about learning about retirement, it is National Retirement Security Week. So this is the perfect time to be having this conversation. Um, and next week, you can check out our 401k core plan with the link Jackson in the chat. If you are still interested in getting these money talk notifications, you can also subscribe to our newsletter um, or make it a point to make sure that we get this out to you. Um, okay, does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, okay. Um, we do, we have a question asking for advice for young folks in their 20s about next steps they can take now to start on their retirement account. Sure. Um... The best thing is to start saving as soon as possible, even if it's a small amount. Um, that is the, the biggest message for, for young people, really. And if your retirement plan offers um, a 401k, I mean, your employer offers a 401k, um, hopefully you can contribute maybe at least as much to get the match. So if they say it's going to be 50% of the first 6%, try to put in 6% because that is guaranteed money. <laughs> you're you're going to double your money that you're putting in. Um, and if you don't have a retirement plan, as long as you have earned income, start that IRA, start either the traditional or Roth IRA. And it is incredible how time can really, really help you. Um, even if you're just putting in a small amount. It's just, this is some people think, oh, it's for retirement. I'm, I'll wait till this age when I make this much. And it, it really has, to, if I can stress anything, do it as soon as possible. Yeah, now now I'm thinking about my next steps for retirement. Mm -hmm. This is great even just for me. Um, somebody asked what IUL insurance is and if it's a good idea for retirement, even if you start in your 20s or later on in life. IUL insurance. We've gotten a couple I'm, questions about IUL insurance. I'm personally not too sure what it is either. You know what? I, I'll, yeah, I'll have, I mean, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, now it's something we should know, and I'll make a note of that for you later, Ben, for the newsletter. Um, we do have another question saying, if you already have a 401k open with your employer, uh, would it make sense to open up an IRA or to put all your contributions into the 401k? Well, as I mentioned, the 401ks are the only place you're going to get a match. So if you are, you know, putting in as much as you can, um, the, the 401k is probably the best bet. There are a lot of factors that can contribute to that. 401ks typically may have cheaper investment options because you're investing as an entire company. So there may be what are called institutional funds in there that aren't available to the general public. Um, those may have lower costs. You could certainly supplement by opening an IRA. There are income limits though that 
determine if you're allowed to, for example, open a Roth. Uh, if you make over certain amounts of money, you're not able to open a Roth. Um, and also, uh, in terms of a traditional IRA, determining how much you make also is something that you'd have to consider uh, if you want to open an IRA. But um, the, the, the more retirement accounts that you can have open, the, the better. But if I were to lean to one personally, uh, it would be on the, on the 401k side. Thank you for sharing on those points. Um, I'll give it a moment as we don't have any questions right now. We do still have a couple of minutes. So if you feel like you do want to ask any questions, definitely go ahead and pop those in the Q&A. Um, is there anything you'd like to point out right now, Ben, while we wait for any questions to come Yeah, in? just to, to, to piggyback on that last comment, I think the 401k, um, very advantageous for, for younger employees, for people that may leave the workforce, they, if they roll to an IRA, that's something that is not taxable, a, a rollover. Um, sometimes IRAs can offer, you know, more investment options or more flexibility in distributions, how often that you can take it out. So, um, but they could have some more expensive options in there. So you just want to kind of make sure you're, you're comparing and doing your due diligence before you do rollovers um, or, or change things. Okay, so let's switch to the opposite age spectrum. Um, somebody says that they are 59 and just started withdrawing from their pension. If they have a substantial amount of savings, do you recommend that they use their savings versus drawing from their pension? Well, is there is their pension something that they have to take at this age or it goes up? It's going to be a little hard to say because it's going to be based on really, a, 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 honestly, a financial plan, whether they would want to be what they would want to be taking from. Um, I would say generally, if they are going to lose a significant amount of money, if they don't, you know, if they wait to take their pension or take it now, it would probably be better not to take it. But that's a kind of a general statement. I wouldn't be able to advise on that specifically. Okay, thank you for your input on that point. Um, somebody says that they had a retirement plan while working at a municipal entity. They don't plan on returning to that field. So is there a benefit to move their savings from there into an IRA, or is it better to keep it in the retirement plan from when they worked with that entity? Sure. It's, it's really going to depend on if, the, if it's a quality retirement plan that they had. Um, there is kind of the saying, if you don't work there, why should your money still be there? Um, sometimes it, it can be easier if you begin to aggregate things in, in one place rather than starting to have many, many accounts. But if, if your other plan was very, very good at very low cost, um, you know, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, you, you certainly can roll it, but uh, again, you don't have to. Thank you very much. Um, I know that we only have a few minutes left as it is 12.55. So I just wanted to say that if you had any other questions following this talk, um, especially if you have conversations that you'd like to have with Empower, definitely feel free to reach out to our email, Money Talk. Um, I can definitely put that in the chat just so we can pass those along once this ends, just in case. Um, somebody did pop up with a question. Uh, I know we do have those last few minutes, so we can pause whenever you feel then. Um, what is a retirement plan for self-employed people? Is, there, is that something you do on your own, or is there something for people specifically who are self-employed? Um, there are a number of things. There can be a solo 401k. There can be what's called a, a SEP IRA. Um, that's something that if you, if you are an employer, you would probably want to talk to an accountant to see what would be most beneficial for you uh, to do that, because there are a number of, of kind of individual types of plans. Okay, great. Well, I'm not really seeing any other questions. I know that we're getting down to the time. So I did want to take this time to say thank you so much, Ben and the team at Empower for coming in with this really useful informational presentation, as well as coming in and answering a lot of those questions there. I have certainly learned so much more. Again, happy Retirement Security Week. Uh, we're definitely living up to that. 
And of course, to plug the next week's uh, Money Talk Tuesday on the 401k next week, same time, same channel, feel free to register. Is there anything that uh, Ben or Lisa, I'm passing the torch back to Empower in case anybody would like to say anything? No, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hope you found it useful. Um, if there is any message that you take away from this, is it at least start trying to save? I know it's not easy, um, but the, the sooner you can, uh, the better. And there's no right answer for you know, everyone. It's gonna be individual, um, but the biggest step you can take is to start saving. Thank you so much, Ben, that was fabulous. And thanks, Jessica. And as is up on the slide, the next Money Talk Tuesday is going to be about a 401k plan that nonprofit organizations can potentially offer their employees. So if you're a decision maker for a nonprofit, you might want to attend, or if you're an employee at a nonprofit, you might want to mention this next um, seminar to your employer. We'd love to speak with you. Great, we'd love to see you all next week. I know people are exiting out now, so let me just say, if you don't mind filling out that exit survey that comes up when you finish, um, that would be great to make sure that we can get you the content you need. But otherwise, I think we'll stop here. Thank you again, Ben, for this really exciting and useful conversation. Um, and everybody let us know if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a fantastic day and rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you all.